Good afternoon. This is CTV and Talk City 91.1 FM. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley has been holding discussions with stakeholders in Tobago over transportation problems between Trinidad and Tobago. The meeting has been taking place at the Magdalena Grand, where the Prime Minister is about to hold a press conference to share details of the meeting. We take you now to the Magdalena Grand for live coverage of the press conference. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the media, and of course, to the listening and viewing public. Welcome to this media conference that is being hosted by Dr. the Honorable Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Dr. Rowley was just hosting a meeting of the stakeholders who came to discuss the sea bridge issue that is affecting people here in Tobago, and now the opportunity will be given to the media to get a synopsis of said meeting and to pose some questions to Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, members of the media, particularly those of you who have come from Trinidad, because we rely on you to carry the information to the wider national community. This afternoon, I was very pleased to be able to talk directly to the various business associations, largely here in Tobago, and um, we did uh, take on board a number of issues, mainly the ferry problems that arose since April, and uh, um, many other issues which are affecting the economy of Tobago and the investors and people of Tobago in general. So uh, we, I was able to outline to them the difficulty that the government had, and maybe I should direct to you, the media, what that difficulty is which generated um, the problem that we are addressing. I was able to point out to the media that basically what happened in disturbing the equilibrium that existed up until April was that the government was given an ultimatum by a service provider which the government could not accept. And the ultimatum given to the government in December carried it on through to March, April. That ultimatum came from the service provider of the Superfast Galicia, which was provided by a company called Intercontinental Services Limited, I think. A company that was not part of the bidding process when bidding opened at the port in 2013 but during the valuation process, this company surfaced. And on query, the company was identified as being the agent for the lawyer that was advising the port on this whole question of the supply of a ferry for the service to Tobago. That ferry came in on a seven month contract, which by extension got to a year and a half and ruled over on more than one occasion without tender. On four occasions under the previous administration attempts were made to go out to tender for this service and for one reason or the other, I shouldn't know, I'm, I'm not correct, not under the previous administration, under this administration and the previous administration, there were four instances when attempts were made to do what had to be done, which is to go out to tender for the service. And for one reason or the other, the tender process failed. On the fifth occasion in March, where well, the cabinet cleared it in March because the tender process is instructed by the ministry and the contract is entered into by the Ministry of Transport, but the port under law does the actual process. On that fifth occasion, when the instructions were given that the tender process should proceed, the service provider gave the government an ultimatum. And the ultimatum was that the government, while being engaged with the service provider, in a contractual arrangement until October 2017 that the government would 
provide to the service provider a five-year contract without tender. It was that the contract should be rolled over for three years with an extension for two years and that that should apply to the company that provided the service by way of the Superfast Galicia. A most amazing thing happened during that period. The service provider wrote to the minister asking the minister to provide this kind of contractual arrangement so as to facilitate the supplier purchasing the Superfast Galicia to go on to provide a service to the port. Now, no minister in any government of Trinidad and Tobago that is looking after the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and who acknowledges that there ought to be a procurement process that can stand scrutiny and that there be competition for the service could have accepted those terms by a service provider. And of course, it came with the threat that if we did not acquiesce to that request, that the boat that was contracted and was providing the service and was being paid for the service, which we expected to be in place until October 2017, that the boat would be withdrawn. The first attempt to blackmail the government on that basis came in December of 2016. And Further, on Easter weekend, when the company attempted to withdraw the vessel on Good Friday to create a calamitous development for the Easter weekend in Tobago. And by, by mid-April, the threat was carried out. We expect that those who presented the government with that ultimatum were of the view that the government would not have been able to say no to the proposal because of the level of disturbance that they could have created and the amount of misinformation that they could have put into the media, the amount of spin that they could have spun in the media, and the government would have acquiesced in response to the request for fear of what could have happened had we not done so. The end result was that the government could not accept those terms and we had to go looking for a replacement service. We had to go for looking for an immediate replacement service because the boat was removed at short notice. I think they gave us a number of days. During that period, the best that we could have done was to find a barge to carry heavy goods and the transporter to carry trucks. That was an immediate response, and that was all that was available. But we gave the country, the, especially, especially to Begonians, the assurance that we will take steps, that within three months, we will find a ferry, a cargo ferry, that will replace the service that was being provided by the Galicia. That service was provided just over three months after, and there is, the, there is a vessel in place now which is providing that service. Subsequent to that, we got a report on the state of the passenger ferries, the Spirit and the Express. And that report was such that we had to respond by taking the Spirit out of service to go into immediate dry dock. Because the two ferries, the Express and the Spirit, the cargo ferries, had been run without the appropriate dry docking to guarantee safety and service. And the point had been reached by the express where it had to be taken out of service. And this, uh, by, the, by the spirit. And the express is scheduled to be taken out of service on October 1st. So that then required another entry into the market for another ferry. This time a ferry for passenger service. This matter was supervised by the Port Authority, which under law is the agency that is responsible for doing that, and the ministry, which engages in the contractual arrangements for providing the vessel to the port. And of course, it requires cabinet approval for the ministry to do that. We successfully provided a service on the cargo side, 
whatever the complaints are with respect to what's on board and so on. And we were anticipating a successful response with respect to the passenger side. And let me correct something here which certain uninformed voices have been putting in the media, that the cost of the service to replace the Galicia is so-and-so figure, and the Galicia was doing it for far less. The Galicia was providing a cargo service, and the Cabo Star is providing a cargo service. Separate that from a passenger service which the ocean floor was scheduled to provide. Having committed ourselves to the Cabo Star and having committed to the ocean floor to solve these two ferry requirements, it had, it had been coming to the government's attention initially and largely from the media which had done some significant investigative work where there were questions as to the source of the supply of these two vessels. The government was not unmindful of the concern and had paid attention to some occurrences in the business. And the end result of all of that is that the Port Authority had taken certain actions recently. The government at the level of the office of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet has taken certain actions. And there are some unfinished business with respect to how the procurement process operated when the government set out to provide the ferry service to Tobago sub-April 2017. I will stop at that point because I'm sure you might have a few questions to ask me and I will try to answer the questions as you put them to me. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Mark Passant, investigative journalist from CCN TV6 News. Um, just on the point of the ocean flower, I just wanted to find out, uh, did Cabinet agree to lease these vessels and on what basis? Who brought the note to Cabinet? When was this note uh, brought to Cabinet? Did anyone present presently at that meeting object and can you present a copy or somebody uh, of that uh, lease uh, to the media to see for approval? I'll start with that. There, there are a lot of questions in there. Let me just back up and explain to you how this thing goes. There's a governance structure in this country. And if you don't observe the governance structure, that itself becomes another issue. At the level of the cabinet, there's a minister of transport appointed by the prime minister. As part of the portfolio of that minister is the port authority, minister of transport. The port authority falls under the minister of transport. That port authority is run by a board appointed by the cabinet. And that board utilizes the expertise of a management. So if you go from below, you have management reporting to the board, board reporting to the minister, minister reporting to the cabinet, and cabinet taking a decision. Okay, let's go to the questions you asked me about what I can provide to you. I am not, as I sit here now, able to provide to you much of what you asked for because I don't really have those details in front of me. But I can tell you that the board would have been guided by its expertise. The board would have reported to the minister at the level of the ministry a cabinet note would have been prepared based on what would have been accomplished by the board because the board will have to make a case to the minister and the minister will have to make a case to the cabinet because it requires cabinet approval for the ministry to authorize that a contract be entered into all of that was done through a cabinet note which came to the cabinet identifying the vessel that would be contracted. That is what is normal, and that is what has happened in this situation. So, <clears throat> which brings me to my next question. If you could ask the question, don't ask 10 at a time, Fair right? Enough. Because otherwise, we, I mean, we, might, enough, we might lose the answers to a few Fair, important words. Fair enough, Dr. Rowley. Uh, what basis were the rental fees determined and by whom? 
and respect to the ocean The rental flower, fees would have been determined by the port, which, have been, which would have been guided by the business of the port, involving the port's management, the supplier of the service, and the authority of the port. That, that, is, that would be dealt with at the level of the port. And what were the specifications required by the suppliers? I couldn't answer that at this point in time. I, and, and again, that would have been a matter dealt with at the port. That would have been the business of the port, dealt with by a board at the port dealing with its management. And on what basis was Bridgman's contracted and what was their initial involvement with the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago? I couldn't answer that question now because it's some of, a part of that question we're still finding out. And that is why that's, that's one of the... You would have observed that I've asked a one-man investigator to go to the port and see what is available there to answer that question. That is one of the questions that I, as Prime Minister, am trying to get an answer to, and that would be related to the Cabinet. Dr. Olio, do you see a conflict of interest with Cabinet appointing an investigator to review a decision that the Cabinet itself made? I don't know of any other person who could have appointed it if the cabinet, if the cabinet wants to proceed, because the cabinet has certain actions to take. The prime minister has certain actions to take, and if one wants to take action based on pertinent information, then I don't know that the authority of the cabinet is circumscribed. Do you see a conflict of interest with the port authority investigating itself? I don't know that the port is investigating itself. I do know that if something went wrong on the port or in any management structure, that the management of such an organization would want to find out what went on. So who are the owners of the, the vessels that have been contracted, i.e. Trinidad Bridgemans Limited, that was awarded this contract to lease these vessels? Have you all been able to find that out I, as yet? At the level of the cabinet, we, the information we have at this point in time is that the port contracted a company called Bridgman. That is, a lot has been said about Bridgman. We don't have any additional information at this time, but in so far as the operations were, the port authority contracted a company that owned a vessel that was available, and that is how they got. Well, based on the information that would have been given to you, sir, was there any negotiations and with who were involved and by whom? And I, I, could not, I could not answer that question because that matter did not come to the cabinet as to who, did, who negotiated with whom. The business of the port would have gone to the ministry. The ministry would have brought a note to the cabinet outlining what has been accomplished at the port. A vessel was sought, meeting certain specifications, and so on and so on and so on. But the details as to who talked to whom, that wouldn't have come to the cabinet. And um, who conducted the site visit? previous to the lease being signed and, and to verify that the vessels met with the specifications. I, I'm afraid I don't have that information, not being the minister responsible for the port, and I'm sure that the, those are questions that you can put to the port. I don't have that information at that specificity of so, personalities. So you don't know when it was done and, and when the visit Those details place. I would not have, but I'm sure if you put such a question to somebody at the port, whether it is management or board, you might be able to get that kind of answer there. I don't have that information. Dr. Rowley, as, as the head of the country and, and, and the cabinet, uh, are you convinced that something has drastically gone wrong and is crooked in this transaction? Yes. Okay, and when, um, what was the findings of the Dun & Bradstreet report that the Port Authority has not, to this day, been able to give um, the public what due diligence was done in, in conducting a background check on the specific company, Bridgman Services LP. They have not been able to do so. Have you been speaking with your line minister to find out where that is? Because they certainly have found after almost seven weeks that there was something definitely wrong with the procurement and the evaluation when it was being um, reported in the media for quite some time. I just answered that question, I said yes. My yes means a lot to me. You think that the Port Authority ignored the findings of the reports which should have been highlighted in this respect? I don't have that information and I don't know that I could come to that conclusion. But I'm sure that the appropriate investigation or investigations can clarify those for us.
I just saw two more questions. If you know the answers to these, how much money was uh, awarded, uh, spent on the, the individual leases in respect to the two vessels? I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but I, I don't know the, the full details of that. But when it came to the cabinet, the figures, I seem to recall, you mean the, the, the day rate? Not the, not the day rate, but just the overall uh, the contract. And um, I guess no, I... No, no, I, do, I don't have that information in front of me. So can you even say what was the cost of the state leasing these vessels, including uh, money spent in discussions, negotiations, lawyers' no, no, I, fees? I, I don't have that information. That is left as a matter for the port and the port board and the ministry, of course. These are separate up. But you must understand that these responsibilities lie at different places. What the port does in terms of spending money at that level in that way doesn't come to the prime minister office or the cabinet. There's a port authority, a statutory body under law with a board appointed to do that. So that detail, I'm sure, again, if you ask that question at the level of the port, you'll get an appropriate answer. I've been asking for quite a while, Dr. Rowley, and I've still not gotten an answer. That's why I sought asking. Well, as I said, the appropriate investigation or investigations would most certainly clarify those matters. And is there a legal fee or finder's fee due to, the, to be paid in this matter? And if so, to whom and how much and when was that monk, has that monk, among been reviewed? While that question is a very pertinent question, I do not have that information. And again, the necessary investigations will determine that. Okay, I think... I think that's, that's it. Prime Minister, good afternoon. I'm Andy Johnson. Good afternoon, Johnson. Andy Johnson. I've been speaking. I've been speaking with a number of stakeholders. After Mark's question, you sure you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. In fact, uh, this big that I've been speaking with with stakeholders in Tobago on this issue over the last couple of weeks, and those with whom I spoke over the weekend said that they were going to be coming here. Uh, hoping to get some assurances. They were going to put some demands on the table and get some assurances of improvements in the services. Uh, in coming into the room moments ago, several of them with whom I touched base on the way out, on, the, on, on, the, on their way out, said that they considered this meeting a waste of their time. How do you respond to that? And what can I, you say about the discussions as to have sought to provide any comfort to them? I don't have, I can, I can only speak for myself and for those who spoke in this room that they had a very valuable experience because a lot of, a lot of issues were raised and interestingly enough I may tell you, a lot of issues not relating to the ferry service were raised in this room this afternoon and those, and those issues, um, many of them do not have um, today's answer for today. For example, one of the issues they raised, in fact, one of the first issues raised this afternoon was the effect of the licensing on property purchase in Tobago, on the reduction in values in Tobago, and the effect that was having on property owners being able to finance their borrowings to keep their businesses going. Now, that surprised me. I didn't expect that to be question number one today, but it was that we discussed it at length. And there were a lot of operational issues that were raised. And we discussed them, and we have quite a few solutions coming up, which were, which were raised here and which found favor. So I have no doubt that there might be voices. Um, and if any person felt that they wasted their time, well, then I didn't think I wasted my time. As a matter of fact, I was very happy that I came here and met with all those business people who are trying to make a living in Tobago. And in this room, there were quite a number of them who expressed an interest that we came here today and we did focus on the matters that are of interest to them. PM, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, sir. I have probably a dozen questions that I hope you can answer. No, don't ask me a dozen questions at the same time. I might... No, I'll ask them I'm one at a time. Just, just ask them one at a time and let's see if we can get through. I don't think you should ask me a dozen questions on any one day. <laughs> There are other people who might have an opportunity mm -hmm. to ask a question, so you ask a couple of questions and we go on to somebody else. But let's, just, let's try. The report from the one-man commission that was initiated, will the findings of that report be made public at any time? I have no doubt that it will be. Okay. Um, the current situation, would you describe it as a crisis? And if so, why the nine-day gap between the invitation to the meeting and the meeting actually taking place? 
Why the what? The gap between the invitation to this meeting and the actual meeting itself taking place. I'm not sure. What, what? So I sent you an invitation nine days ago mm -hmm. for today's meeting. And you're asking me a question on that? You if have, it was you, a wait crisis. A minute, wait a minute. You have, you have, you have, a, you have valuable question time. Mm -hmm. Let's get to something serious, no man. Okay. The issues with respect to the Cabo Star, what exactly is being done to remedy those issues and how soon those will be rectified? Well, I, they, um, some of those issues came up today about the scheduling. That to me, the, the, um, for me, the most um, pertinent question that was raised today was the scheduling of the vessel so as to allow Tobagonians who travel between Trinidad and Tobago to make best use of the service um, and that is a matter which the port will have to address so that the vessel while it is on the service can be maximized and it all has to do with when the vessel leaves port of spain and when it leaves tobago and so on and these are operational issues which i propose to raise that the minister is here and the minister would have heard that and i'm sure he and the port board and so on and the Tobagonians would, would work that out. That's an operational issue. And what about the issue of the roaches and the rats and the... And, the, might, and the mites. Yes. Those are operational issues mm -hmm. that can be dealt with and are dealt with all the time on vessels, fumigation, management and so on, rats on boats. You don't sink the boat for a rat on the boat, you go and kill the mice. You kill the mice and you, and you fumigate the boat. These are operational issues. And we are expecting that the Port Authority and the owners will deal with those issues so that they can be comfort on the vessel. Can you shed some light on when the, exactly the TNT spirit will return to service no. along with the TNT flash, the Trini flash, sorry? I, I would leave that for the Minister of Works and the Port to answer. We are, one of the most important thing is that the Express is due to go on dry dock. Right. The so spirit, will the spirit the, return before the Express goes? I don't know. I don't think so. The, so the, what would happen when the express goes? Well, that's a difficult situation that we have to deal with because if the, spirit, if the express goes while the spirit is still on dry dock, then we, we don't have any government vessel. The port is moving a pace to have a vessel in place before the express goes on dry dock. That is the situation we try to accomplish. And if that is not accomplished, then well, the express may have to, we don't want to miss the dry dock slot because the, the, that slot is already um, o -o overdue. So that is a situation we are facing that the two vessels, the express and the spirit, had not been dry docked for a long time and their requirement for dry dock is getting more and more critical. The inspection of the floor that was done this month, why did that not take place before it was actually agreed to bring the vessel to this country? I don't know. Why was Leon Grant suspended from the port? I think the port suspended Mr. Grant and issued a public statement, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Okay. And my final question with respect to the hospitality workers on the fast ferry. They would have written to you since May about their circumstances. Hospitality workers on the ferry? The persons who serve the food and help to keep the, um, the fast ferries clean and so forth. And they they normally dress in black and white. And, and they wrote to me? They wrote to you in May, mm -hmm. highlighting some issues that they had with respect to the SWWTU and seeking your intervention. They're seeking my intervention with the SWWTU? Yes. And they're the workers hired by the SWWTU? There is an apparent conflict of interest that they are seeing. And the treatment that they are meted out with is not the best. They have tried to remedy it before, and they met with no success. And so they were asking for the intervention of both the Prime Minister, the Minister of Labor, and a third person whose name escapes me at this point in time, but there were three letters sent out. I, am, I, am, I can't say that I saw that letter, but um, what you're raising there is a very interesting development, that, do, that do, the workers are complaining against the employer, which is the union? Yes. The union has the contract to provide workers to do those tasks so on the, so the, the So the union is the employer? Yes. 
and the workers have written to me about the union's behavior. Yes. Good Lord. <laughs> I haven't seen that letter yet, but I'm sure that's an interesting development. Is it something you will try to pursue? Well, I wouldn't look at, I mean, it wouldn't be personal to me, but I, there, there, there's a Ministry of Labor, yeah. and there are other, there's, a, there's a minister responsible for the court, mm -hmm. and if there are developments of that nature, of course we'd have an interest in the workers' complaints. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Rishi Harry Nanan from Good CNN. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Rishi. Um, just a couple questions. One being, you mentioned um, the owners of the Superfast Galicia had given an ultimatum. You went into what that was earlier. Um, is the government looking to take any action against the owners of this vessel? Yes. We have sought legal advice of the nature of the contract that existed between the state, between the port, the ministry, and this supplier. We've got one senior council advice so far that a contract was in place due to expire in October 2017. Out of an abundance of caution, we have sent the documents to a second senior council. We are awaiting advice from that senior council. And once the advice that we get at the level of the ministry, that the state was in a contractual arrangement with Intercontinental, we expect that the government will take the appropriate legal action. And how long do you think we may have to wait for that? That depends on the lawyers. Um, the Port Authority had mentioned that uh, they think the procurement process was compromised. Um, what does this say for the procurement legislation and how do we plan to probably implement that? It says nothing for the procurement legislation because when we bring that legislation into place, that does not mean that attempts to procure goods and services would not from time to time meet with compromise. One has to identify where the compromise exists and when it exists and treat with it. And if the port's authority, which is the authority under law that is required to do these things, if it says to the population that it has come to its attention that its process has been compromised, I think that's a good starting point. Um, there are, you, you appointed Mr. Mute as the sole investigator, but some have said that that is probably not the best way to go, some hinting at the JSC and other ways to probably find out what went wrong. Um, do you welcome any other suggestions? Or? There's nothing to prevent. As a matter of fact, as I said to the business commun community here in Tobago, I welcome the call for a joint select committee of the parliament to look at this matter because it will involve persons providing answers in full public view and explain themselves at the level of the parliament. And I am very happy that this is being done and the government will cooperate with it fully. And I expect the port and all persons and all interested parties to cooperate with this matter. And I also heard about an investigation by the Integrity Commission. I welcome that as well for what, whatever purpose and whatever benefit. At the end of the day, nothing that has happened so far could prevent these investigations from proceeding, right? Um, some have said that Mr. Mute is a financier of the PNM, hence a conflict of interest. Well, um, there's some that have said that obviously know something that I don't know, and I don't know that um, I can prevent some from saying things like that, right? <laughs> what I do know, what I do know is that Mr. Mute is a highly respected member of the business community of Trinidad and Tobago. And the people who have been most affected by these developments and who have complained the most of the last three months about the unacceptable developments at the port come from the business community. And therefore, I see no problem in asking a member of the business community to look at the state's operations there to see what is going on there. And as Prime Minister, I await his report, and it in no way influences or affects what others can do in their investigations. But to say that there's no authority to do that and to try to demonize Mr. Mute, all that will accomplish is that any time in the future, a member of the public is asked to serve in this country, whether on a board or an investigation, they will think twice before they serve. And that is what some people want to achieve. 
this may not be um, directed to what is happening now, but probably you might be able to respond. The labor movement um, protested outside your office last week, and they want to meet with you. Are you, are you going to do that? I, I, I mean, I have been meeting with labor for the longest while. You know, I have met with the labor movement on many occasions. I have met with the labor movement when last two Wednesdays ago I met with somebody from the labor movement. And if it is that I have to meet with the labor movement, I will. As a matter of fact, I, when I get up from this table, I'm asking my staff to ask the labor movement to meet with me on Wednesday afternoon. The labor movement to meet on Wednesday afternoon. There's no problem with me meeting with the labor movement. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. Good afternoon, Anna. Anna Ramdas from the Express newspaper. Uh, can you please share some information with respect to the three-man committee that the cabinet appointed, led by Mr. Alexander, to look at the general operations of the port? What is their okay. mandate? The mandate of that committee is to look at the operations of the ferry service, not procurement. We were having a number of instances, starting with the whole question of the ferries not being dry docked as required. And as a result of that dry docking not taking place, the fast ferry became the slower ferry, became the slow ferry. And in fact, there were reports in, which came to us, which we have in documentary form, where certain developments had taken place with respect to the integrity of the service because of its operational aspects. I don't know if you're aware that in order to try to provide this fast ferry service to Tobago, the port created a separate company to operate it. There's a ferry service company that is operating the ferry service. And even with that in place, we have found that certain operational things were not being done, not the least of which is the scheduling and operationalizing of the dry docking of the vessels. So we have put in place a team of people with expert opinion, one of whom is a former marine superintendent who had retired a few years ago, and of course, the Lyle, um, Lyle Alexander. People with expertise in that area and the port engineer, that three-man team, to look at the operational side of the ferry service. And that was done a few weeks ago. Uh, while there's a lot of focus on the sea bridge and all the problems there, there's also a lot of problems with respect to the air bridge. I mean, right now at the ENR R. Robinson Airport, there are a lot of people waiting for flights. Uh, we were hearing talk that there's a lot of cancellations. So have there been any solutions to address the problems with respect to the air bridge? I don't know what is going on there. Um, over and above the normal, last night we had some cancellations, and um, today we had some other cancellations, I understand. I don't, I don't want to speak for Caribbean Airlines and speak out of turn, but I don't know. Chairman, do you have any information? Not that you can share this time. But the, the chairman of CAL is here, here with us um, for the meeting this evening. I know that um, CAL has been providing um, additional services to take up the slack from what is happening with the, with, the, with the ferry service. We do have three vessels running on the ferry service. While one is talking about a crisis situation in Tobago, we have three vessels servicing Tobago right now. We have a cargo vessel with surplus capacity. We have the express still in operation and we have a water taxi. While this isn't a perfect situation, that is a level of service which is being provided and a certain capacity to take passengers and cargo. And we are working on improving that. And also, we have Cal taking up some slack on the other side. But we, we, we have a limited number of airline seats that can be made available. We are operating a system where people can book at will and travel at will without penalty. This matter has come before the cabinet and some adjustments will have to be made so that the seats that are made available at Cal will give the best opportunity for nationals to travel on the ferry service. 98,000 cancellations took place at Cal recently with respect to seats that were made available 
that were booked by people who did not travel. What that meant is that persons who wanted to make a booking 98,000 times could not book because somebody else had made the booking and that person didn't travel. And that forces people to try to travel on standby. So we are reviewing the situation, and in, in very short order, we will make some adjustments there to ensure that this does not continue. Good afternoon, Dr. Rowley. Good Cassandra afternoon. Thompson, Forbes, TNT Guardian. Um, despite the cancellation of the contract with the Ocean Flower 2, it is said to be still en route to Trinidad and Tobago. Would it be still accepted by the TNT government? As far as I'm aware, the Port Authority advising the government, the ministry, has advised the principals of that boat that their contractual arrangements have ceased. The owners are free to travel with the boat on any ocean they wish. But coming to Trinidad and Tobago, the contractual arrangements have been terminated for cause. Okay. Um, my second question. Tobago hoteliers have signaled that they had approximately $25 million in losses since the ferry saga started. Um, they would have also indicated that they would not meet their end of year target. Would the government look at some form of compensation to the Tobago stakeholders? The government will try to provide whatever reasonable relief that can be provided and that can be afforded. The government is very cognizant of the situation and the hardships faced by Tobagonians who were already facing significant hardships before these developments. And anything that we can do that is reasonable, we will want to consider. But I don't know about compensation. When you are in the business place, in the business world, there are certain knocks that come your way. And if the government can make any action that will bring about some amelioration to the losses or to the discomfort the government will. But I wouldn't hear um, commit to any compensation as such. Um, the Tobago hoteliers, well, hoteliers and guest houses, they usually pay a 10% tax um, annually. Would the government look at a moratorium as to assist these businesses this year, looking at it in the budget? That is a matter that came up in the meeting this afternoon, and it was discussed, and um, I wouldn't want to commit at this table, but it's something that I would have to raise with the Minister of Finance, who also has other kinds of crises to deal with. And I may say something to you, eh? and it is only when something is not available, like good health, that you fully appreciate how much good health is valuable. Like the ferry service, we took it for granted. Now that this disturbance has taken place, every person in Tobago and many in Trinidad now understand how vital that umbilical cord is and the knock-on effect if it is not there. And therefore, when there, are other, there are other services provided and other assistance provided which are being taken for granted. And it's against that background that it was felt at the time when that tax was imposed that hoteliers need to make their contribution even though they were having some difficulty. But like other citizens, they need to make that 10% contribution so as to ensure that they are not getting a free ride because the government put a number of other things in place which only they benefit from. And therefore, when one talks about removing the 10%, it's against the background that there are other things that they are getting which are still available. But given that they have got this extra hardship which is none of their doing and it also has the effect of damaging the, the contribution they can make to the economy we will want to consider what relief we can give but i wouldn't want to commit to that this afternoon until i speak to the minister of finance to see where he is at and where we are at with respect to the loss of revenue that we are all experiencing at this time dr rollo tobago stakeholders are also they have indicated that they are also behind on their loans and bank loads credit union loads as the case may be would there be some sort of conversation with the banking sector, to, especially when this is an issue where the government is involved, the ferry is involved, to give these, these hoteliers and guest house owners some level of reprieve? Let's put it this way. I would not be the one to want to commit to talking to bankers because bankers are very difficult to talk to. However, 
in managing the business of the country, the banks have clients. And without clients, there's no bank. And if their clients are experiencing temporary hardships, I'm sure that any good banker would want to keep his or her client alive so that they can live to fight another day. And my final question, I know, can you just give us a synopsis of some of the solutions that were um, highlighted coming out of this meeting, medium, short term to medium term to long term, please? All right. Thank you. Um, immediate to short term is that given the surprising failure of the arrival of the ocean flower, which did not pass muster to be uh, able to provide us with the anticipated service. The port would be working overtime, going out using the wider spectrum of call, wherever vessels are available, from owners and from brokers, to find an appropriate vessel in the shortest possible time. What has happened before, accidentally or otherwise, is that the port ended up restricting its search and selecting under questionable circumstances. That is now the subject of the investigation. Now, the government has instructed the port to open the search in the widest possible way and in the quickest possible time get a vessel here. Um, we are now coming to the end of summer. A vessel, looking for a vessel in September into October is a lot easier than looking for one in June, July. Because as you know, June, July, it's the summer traffic in the Northern Hemisphere, everybody's using their vessel. Now, going into fall and winter, there should be more vessels available, but we must broaden the search. And whatever went wrong with respect to the restriction of the search will not, or ought not to form part of a new search. So we'll be working over time to try and get a passenger vessel here as quickly as possible. That's the short term to immediate. In the medium term, we are going out to tender for a vessel. If we find a good one in this immediate search, we go for a two, to two year to a three year contract, which will give us a lower price and it will give us time to place an order for a new vessel built to our specification for delivery towards the end of that contract. Cabinet has already taken the decision that we are going to place an order for a vessel built to our specification um, to be owned by the state, to be operated by the port. So we have the short, the immediate, the immediate and, the, and the longer term. The longer term is the purchase of our own ferry and in the intervening period, a three-year contract. Um, that is the solution with respect to having a cargo service. And of course, when the spirit and the express come off dry dock, they will be good for another two years. So we'll have ample ferry service going forward in the medium to the long term as we, as, as we solve this problem on a sustained basis. Second, um, we also agreed that the port would look at the operational difficulties. Because many of those who spoke today spoke of difficulties that they're experiencing with the Cabo Star as a result of how it is operated by the port, the scheduling and also the issues of conditions on board the vessel. So those things are to be looked at very urgently by the port to address some of the um, concerns of those who use the vessel. Yes, Andy? You want to use the microphone, please, Andy? To what extent would you say that the stakeholders, the stakeholders here were comforted and satisfied with those decisions and those promises. I didn't hear the first part of your question. To what extent would you say that the stakeholders at this meeting this afternoon I could ask you, to... you were the one who told me you spoke to people who said it was a waste of their time. Yes. Well, yeah. I, I don't I'm know you, your response. I can't answer that question yeah. only. You are the one who told yes. me you spoke to somebody Some who told them, you it was yes. a waste of time. If what we are discussing here is a waste of time, well then it means something else to me. I thought yeah. we discussed pertinent issues that had to deal with the business of the persons who gathered here. And I will tell you something else too. In Tobago making its case, I gave them a commitment today that the port board would be expanded to have another two people from Tobago on the port board to make sure that Tobago's interest is properly looked after so that these accidents don't take place and put Tobago in this situation. We also agreed that we'll put an operation, a committee in place 
with the private sector, THA, and central government to focus on operationalizing the proposals that have been, that have been put to this meeting this evening. Yep. And if that is a waste of time, then I have pleasantly wasted mine. Yeah, but your perspective is as important as theirs, and I was trying to get your perspective on, on what you think that... that I just point told you, I thought we had a very productive meeting. Thank you very, very much. Very productive. We addressed a number of issues, not the least of which was the ferry service, but we also addressed the other questions which were not part of the immediate... Our concerns. Good afternoon, Mr. Prime Minister. Good afternoon. My name is Anthony R. Hector from TICN News Agency in Tobago. The two main questions I have for you. One, since the part of the Galicia, you made a statement in Trinidad that there's a possibility of criminal charges to come out of whatever was taking place by virtue of the contract or the operations of the Galicia. I didn't hear anything else from you on it. I don't know if you said it in Trinidad and we didn't hear it in Tobago. I would like you to uh, please give me a follow-up on that. Secondly, I've, I've looked at you as Prime Minister since this... Let, 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 let's, let's deal with the first question. First. Okay. <clears throat> I would like to draw your attention um, to an article in the, I think it was the Guardian, Kamal George's, Kamal works for the Guardian, right? Yeah, he's CNC. There's an article in the Guardian on April 16th. And I choose my word very carefully, my words very carefully, I try to at least. And you said I said that there would be criminal charges. Possibly, yes. I didn't say that. What I said was from the documents I have seen, I have good reason to believe that there would have been criminal conduct in those who carried out that Galicia contract. And I passed the matter to the Attorney General to advise me as to whether my view is supported. So the AG hasn't reported. Let me finish. What surprised me is that having said that, as Prime Minister of this country, to that specific situation, and I I will answer by asking you to read the article of Kamal George's on the 16th of April. What surprised me is the level of bullfacedness that attended the attempt to find a ferry in this year under this government. And I say no more on that for the moment. <laughs> okay. So the second issue, Mr. Prime Minister. Yes, let me hear a second question. I, I've been looking at you in terms of your interests since the Seabridge crisis, some people want to call it. Let's call it the development. You had a discussion around Easter on the ground in Tobago. You traveled from Trinidad and Tobago to Tobago, sorry, on the vessel. This is the second stakeholders meeting. So my question to you is, you have outlined the various responsibilities various arms have, like port, board, and minister of transport, and so on. Do you as prime minister have any power or powers that could change the look or the face of this crisis in any one move? Now that's my last question. It, it may sound you know, difficult, but if you can't answer it, you can't answer it. I'll but answer, I'd like I'll, you to answer I'll, I'll answer it in this way. All powers are circumscribed. And in so far as there's any authority to impact upon the situation, that's why I'm here, and that's why I maintain the post of Prime Minister at the moment. Um, Supplementary we'll be question. winding up in a few Yes, just wanted to find out the Additional persons who you said would be added to the board. We haven't reached our stages yet. We've who would just, be the persons? We, we haven't reached our stages yet. We say, today, mm -hmm. a decision was put out that we will do that. So we haven't selected the persons as yet. But a decision has been made. Mm -hmm. And has been said that the ports board would be increased by having um, two Tobagonians on it. We now have one person from Tobago on the port board, right? You're asking me the names of the person I'm saying no, they no, haven't no, been no, selected no. yet. No, what I'm asking mm. is, 
who would be charged with the responsibility of getting those two additional persons? Would it be the central government? Would it be the THA? Would it be... Normally, board, board members from Tobago are appointed by consultation with the central government and the THA makes recommendations to the cabinet because they are cabinet appointees. Okay? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen of, of the media, for joining us this evening, and we hope you have a safe journey back to your media houses. Have a good night. Thank you very much.